Hey, hello. Hello. How are you doing? Yeah, not bad. How are you? Yeah, good, good. Um, so yeah, I thought we'd take a quick look at memory today. Um, obviously, that's quite a big topic. Um, so it's going to be quite a focused look, but I'm hoping to kind of start at the conceptual level and then go all the way through to like molecular mechanisms and show a quite cool experiment. Okay, um, cool. And then we'll, we'll kind of go from there. So I'm just going to switch back to the notebook. Yeah, cool. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I think we'll, we, so we use this essay to kind of frame the session. Okay. Um, so if we start actually by uh, kind of looking at this title, um, are there any kind of parts in particular that stand out to you as you were addressing um, that? Right, okay. So let's understand the electron mechanism of LPP. Tell us kind of thing about how memories are stored in memory. In terms of how I would go about approaching the, the question. Yeah, what are the kind of key terms you would put out there? So understanding. Yeah. Um, molecular. So talking obviously on a quite a small, small level basis, not a kind of larger physiology level, but properly on a molecular basis. LTP. Yeah. Um, memories. Uh, and storage, and obviously we're talking about memory and LTP, so it's going to be brain related. But I suppose that's also an important one. Yeah. So I think let's uh, let's start with memories. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, I guess a good starting point is uh, what is a memory? Um, <clears throat> as in the textbook definition of, or just a general kind of? Well, try and give me sort of your most succinct summary. Um, so uh, either a, a stored kind of. Um, ability to recall a fact or a place or a name or a person so recall something or do sort of the knowledge of doing something an action so an action or a, a recall fact of something um it's obviously not the most succinct explanation yeah but... so one i quite like um to have heard used is a uh, it's um a change in behavior following experience a change in behavior following experience okay uh, yeah so yeah, I'm just trying to that, that, that works on in terms of a um Kind of responding to pain, as in memory and pain on a basic level, or, or adapting your behaviours and stuff. But I suppose, in terms of your the most kind of lay explanation of memory, it doesn't help to explain kind of. I mean, I suppose it's a change of behaviour. Is your change of behaviour is then being able to recall a fact? But yeah, so it's, it's kind of difficult, isn't it, to have something that fits both you know like rats on one end and yeah. us talking about what we did last week. Uh -huh. so. But they're all similar processes. Yeah, although I guess one of the things we've touched on there is different types of memory, isn't it? Yes, certainly. As with with recall or action, obviously they're different different types of memory in themselves. Yeah. So it might be it might be quite good to take a look at that actually. So I'm just going to bring an image in here. Okay. Um, so have you seen something like this before? Uh, yes, I have indeed. Um, Short-term memory. Yes. So obviously, you know, the processes that go on kind of here and here, and interestingly, back from long-term memory to short-term memory, are all in themselves fascinating. Um, yeah. But let's not focus too much on on those mm -hmm. at the moment. I think today we're just going to focus more on on long-term memory. Okay. Um, and that, that's what we tend to talk about. You know, when you're talking about recall or mm -hmm. Um, behavioral change, you know, that is long term memory. Um, yep. So you see these, these kind of these distinctions here. Um, mm -hmm. So when you were talking about recall, that's mm -hmm. what we call declarative memory. Yeah. Um, and then actions is comes under under procedural. Uh, yep. So, so we might do a, a little labeling exercise on the on the next page where we try and sort of look at what an example of procedural memory, an example of episodic memory, an example of semantic memory. Yeah, yeah, I've definitely come across procedural semantic episodic. Uh, what's autobiographical? Well, so autobiographical is an interesting one because it's quite easy to argue that it's just a subset of episodic memory okay because it's episodic memories that happen to you right okay um so in terms of the way you encode those it's similar it's just whether okay. you're because either way right, yeah, 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 exactly. um <clears throat> visual memory is more about your recognition of certain visual forms so that's why yeah. priming takes place you know where you can expose people to certain stimuli which makes them more likely to respond in yeah, a certain yeah. Way further down the line. But yeah let's let's have a you know quick look at some examples of procedural semantic and episodic memory okay, okay. On this, uh, next page So maybe if you could try and label those um, with with which are procedural, episodic, or semantic, you think they are. Uh, okay, Jake. Might be. So this one is definitely procedural. Oh, that's the wrong pen color. Let's go for box. So now I've got to refresh my memory on episodic and semantic. Episodic means remembering episodes, occasions, etc., and semantic being places and things. So this one's going to be episodic. I'll just go with an e, and this one will be semantic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So yeah, I think that's a useful kind of overview of different types of memory. Um, but let's actually return to that essay. Yeah. Um, okay. And so the the next stage that I think it would be uh, to look at is uh, is LTP. Okay. Um, and the molecular mechanisms of LTP. Yeah. Uh, so again, a sensible place to start there is uh, probably what is LTP. And that is a, a big. Um, well, first of all, what's it stand for? <laughs> long term potentiation. Yeah. I believe. Um, and it is, if memory serves, um, to do with. Um, a repeated firing of certain you're going to be able to explain this a lot better to me but the, the terms that i'm remembering repeated firing of certain neurons therefore upregulating the actions of others and it's involved in in memory of all 
or is it the way I remember being taught was or maybe it was first discovered in the cerebellum, was it? Uh, hippocampus, actually. Um, okay. But let's, I mean, let's take a take a quick look at that. Um, so yeah, could you could you label on here where the uh, where the hippocampus is? I should be able to. Um, <laughs> hippocampus is it's not the it's normally because we're taking a straight sagittal section through there, aren't we? So um, what's in here? Is it this one? Yeah, exactly. Correct. Um, and do you know why it's called the hippocampus? Uh, I do not know. It's because its shape resembles that of a seahorse. Um, okay. The Latin for seahorse is roughly hippocampus. That's weird because I, because another fun fact: this, if memory serves, am I right in saying that's the fornix? Yes. Do you know why the fornix is called the fornix? I do not. To do with arches. No. So the the term for arch. I'm not sure. Latin, Greek. I can't remember which. I think it's Latin. As you, I, one or the other. But yes, fornix being arch, and they look pretty similar. But fair enough. Um, so yeah, that's where it was uh, first discovered, and then you yeah. were talking about um, it being an increase in response following stimulation. Um, mm -hmm. So I think this experiment shows that quite nicely. Mm -hmm. um, so this is kind of the classic LTP experiment. So up here at the top, you can see the experimental setup. Yeah. So they're stimulating the Schaefer collaterals in here. What are Schaefer collaterals? I'd say a neuron in the hippocampus. Okay. Um, and then they're measuring the potential at the synapse between the Schaefer collateral and the CA1 cells. Okay. Um, so that's that recording is, is the output that you can see here on the on the y-axis. Yeah. Um, and you, you've got over time here. So you see they, they start uh, with sort of gentle periodic stimulation and you get mm -hmm. a response of 0.02. Yeah. As then here is point of tetanus, which means really intense repeated stimulation. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see that reflected by this massive increase in the excitatory postsynaptic potential. Yeah. Then following that, they return to the normal level of stimulation. So you mm -hmm. can see there's an increase in the excitatory potential. So this this tetanus is this just just loads of short and it's the same each each kind of dot the black green or purple dots are the same level of stimulation but this tetanus is just rapid firing over the, a really short space of time and they hammered it for however many times in a row. Yeah, correct. Cool. <clears throat> so you can see as as you kind of said earlier, the potentiation now is that the same input mm -hmm. creates a greater excitatory potential. Yes, it, the response is potentiated. Mm -hmm. um, so there are quite a few different types of LTP. Mm -hmm. uh, they change during development um, and anatomically as well. Mm -hmm. um, there are kind of two classic types are the NMDA yep. receptor dependent. Mm -hmm. if you've heard. That's the only one I think I've come across. Okay, so that's the one we're going to look at in more detail, but there's also the m blue R receptor dependent yeah, definitely not pathway, um, and then there are you know, a number of other mechanisms as well, uh, which we won't get into either. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I think we'll, uh, we'll take a look at NMDA receptor dependent. Yeah, I bet it's, is that the best characterized one that there is? Yeah, it's kind of the archetypal example. Yeah. Um, so we've got this, this diagram here shows it quite nicely um, mm -hmm. and also highlights a very key property of the NMDA yeah. receptor. Um, so you'll see here it says the NMDA receptor is activated by glutamate binding but only after depolarization removes inhibitory magnesium. Mm -hmm. um, so what that means is that the NMDA receptor acts as a coincidence detector. Okay. Um, so that means it's only activated when the neuron is already potentiated. Yeah. So two events are connected. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where it's kind of gained its position as one of the mechanisms that underlies associative memory. If you want to associate yeah. things, then you have to detect coincidence. Yeah. Um, so you can see the process here. This, this cells are depolarized, so the magnesium's been removed from the yeah. receptor. Glutamate is bound to it. Uh, that's open the pores, and then calcium's influx mm -hmm. the cell, mm -hmm. uh, causing a post-synaptic potential. Mm -hmm. um, that then triggers, over here, increased production and trafficking of AMPA receptors mm -hmm. to the cell surface. And, and these are a kind of simpler type of receptor that are just kind of always on. So as soon as yeah. glutamate binds, then they'll let ions flow through. Yeah. Um, so that is, in its simplest terms, of how LTP works. And if you load up, if you've got more ampere receptors here, then when the next potential comes down here and all the glutamate's released, mm -hmm. then it's got more ampere receptors to bind to. So the influx is, is greater and you see that increase. Not yeah. 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 <clears throat> um, so that's, yeah, that's the molecular mechanisms. I think to mm -hmm. return to the essay here, um, I think the important thing this question is getting at is, does understanding the molecular mechanisms tell us anything about how memories are stored? Mm -hmm. So I think the final stage is to connect the molecular mechanisms to how memory is stored. Yeah, so as in long-term versus short-term? Well, just how do you link one of those molecular mechanisms to an example of a memory being formed? Okay. Uh, a long-term memory, as opposed to a short-term memory. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a really lovely experiment uh, that involves the Morris Water Maze. I don't know if you've heard of that before. The Morris Water Maze? Yeah. Is that one of the things that they put rats through in? It is indeed. <clears throat> so you've got old ratty here, and he's swimming mm -hmm. in a you know, big circular bowl. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a platform hidden under the water, but the water mm -hmm. is opaque, so it, it can't see through it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's designed as a test of spatial memory. So the first time ratty does this trial, he's got no idea where on earth this platform is. So he's just swimming around all over the shop, 
and eventually he stumbles across the fact. Yeah. So that's the first trial. Mm -hmm. With each subsequent trial, he learns where the platform is. Yeah. So and yeah, that is supported by spatial memory. So then, um, what after after kind of three, four goes, he kind of works out that he wants to go like that. Yeah, it's it's, it's generally more than that. Uh, you know, <laughs> we're talking ten, fifteen, um, okay. and there's still a little bit of a roundabout route, um, but it probably looks a bit like that. Okay. Um, so he, it's pretty clear he knows where the platform is. Yeah. Um, Why does he want to find the platform? Because he doesn't like being in the water. Oh, okay. He wants to be out of the water. Um, so I'm just going to bring in a few uh, of these that we can draw on. It's a really nice experiment where you took a control group of rats mm -hmm. um, and then you took a group of rats that had their NMDA receptors blocked. Mm -hmm. um, and you ran the experiment with both of them across a number of different trials. So say up here we've got trial equals one for each, mm -hmm. and down here is after training, so say 15. Yeah. Um, so could you have a go at drawing on yeah. what you think? So say they start in quadrant <coughs> C each time. Quadrant C? Yeah. Okay. Um, you can see the platform. Like, what do you think that looks like? So obviously we did that first one, but start there. So, yeah. so control one first with um, kind of all over the place. I'll eventually find it. Yeah. <coughs> Similarly, I'll do the, the NMDA block one. Uh, first one again, it's just going to be pretty similar. Obviously not exactly the same, but presumably pretty similar. End up there. Um, as we discussed on the last one, uh, we had, you said that it was still a little bit of wondering about, but generally knew where it was and got there pretty easily. Yeah. If going on what we said, that the NMDA receptor is required for this <coughs> long-term potentiation, which is potentially required for um, storage of memory, um, then I'm guessing this one may look still pretty similar. I would guess it's not the only mechanism, so there might be some, it might be slightly faster, I don't know, but, or, or is there a complete, a complete lo loss of ability to do that, and is it similarly completely squiggly? Is it more like the first two? Um, no, you're, you're about right there. So actually we can, uh, we can look at you know, the results from the paper. Um, so you can see the control there is actually wonders a little bit more uh, okay. than, than you might think, but the uh, the rat treated with an NMDA receptor blocker is all mm -hmm. over the shop. Before it ends yeah. The, uh, yeah. Um, so these these two here are both T fifteen, are they? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so yeah, I think we've seen there when we talk about memory in general, we've looked at molecular mechanisms in particular, but then seen how interfering with those mechanisms can affect how memories are stored, thereby supporting the idea that those mechanisms support memory. Storage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, I mean that's it really. I don't know if you've got any other questions at all. Uh, no, is there any? I, no, I think most of that <clears throat> seems to make sense. Is there, are there things that look at blocking um, the? I've forgotten the name of it. Was it? What was the name of the other receptor? The AMPA receptor. Is there blocking that, or is or is that because that's a simpler thing? Is blocking that cause a lot more problems? Than... Yeah. So if you if you block the AMPA receptor, you cause uh, any number of issues um, okay. because it is so uh, uniform, universal. Um, okay. And what about the other effects of the NM blocking that NMDA receptor? Um, well, so you can do that a bit more selectively, um, and you're you're stopping potentiation rather than any transmission. Okay. Um, the NMDA receptors don't make up a significant part of the transmission potential, whereas the AMPA receptors do. Okay, cool. No, I think that makes sense. Cool, good stuff. Well, well, then. Then. Thank you very much. No worries. See you later. See you later. Bye. <clears throat>